And now, please welcome Luke Wilson and Jesse Keenan. Few material aspects of our city engender as much controversy as super tall buildings, which we define here as buildings taller than 300 meters or 984 feet, as prescribed by the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats. Whether defined as vertical bank vaults or engines of economic development, the discourse behind super tall buildings has been clouded by subjectivities that are reinforced by a type of pseudoscientific appeal to their various environmental impacts. In fact, very little science on the impact of super tall buildings exists. One of the few published scientific studies relates to mortality, uh, for mortality rates for cardiac victims. Spoiler alert, not good news for overweight billionaires. To advance a more rigorous dialogue, we've set forth to evaluate a variety of methodologies as to how one could evaluate the environmental impacts of an emerging typology. However, it's first important to contextualize the use of these methodologies. So think of the introduction of the MRI or the X-ray in medicine. These methodologies didn't take away from the expertise or judgment of the doctor, but rather allowed them to make more informed decisions faster. So similarly, we can think of the use of these methodologies as an architectural or urban MRI. They won't give us the answer or solution, um, but allow us to make more informed decisions. Today, we have chosen three aspects to focus on, direct light, ambient light, and visibility. To do this, we will briefly examine each aspect within a variety of projects to compare and contrast how cities have engaged the iterative design process to maximize environmental quality and public benefit. We will, of course, return to 57th Street and Midtown to contextualize these findings to our own emerging corridor of super tall buildings. In certain cases in Boston, the city regulates new buildings based on the duration of new shadow created. They quantify the new area that is in continuous shadow for at least one hour or more, which can be understood as the overlap of shadows between two hours. So here, highlighted in orange throughout the day. In the design and development of a new KPF project in Boston along the harbor front, the shadow duration regulations came into play. And so in this case, the city wanted us to keep any one hour net new shadow off here highlighted in blue, off of publicly accessible pier highlighted in green. And so we created a digital version of the city regulation and were able to meet the demands of the client while satisfying the needs of the city. And so next we take this type of shadow casting regulation and apply it in a comparison of the Time Warner Center and this, the 50, new 57th Street corridor towers. And in this case, the one hour net new shadow is in blue, and between these two, there's very little new shadow created, and it's relatively even. And that's because most of the duration of one hour shadow is already covered by existing buildings. Um, but we can and should be more rigorous than Boston. So we also looked at the 30 minute shadow duration. So here you can see the impact is much larger, still similar between the comparison. And the important takeaway here is the shape of the duration shadow created. And this has to do with the form of the building. So Time Warner Center, which in comparison is shorter and wider, actually casts a much deeper shadow duration than the 57th Street buildings, and their shadow duration is caused by the base of their building. This work highlights that shadow casting isn't just sensitive in durational terms, it's also sensitive in terms of seasonality. This begins to highlight the distinction between shade and shadow. Whereas shadow bears a negative connotation, shade might otherwise have a positive environmental implication. Therefore, a shadow in one season may be shade in another. This is an increasingly important distinction in an era of climate change. For every one month that we cool the building in New York City, we will heat that same building for three and a half months. However, with climate change, we are spending more and more energy cooling buildings for longer periods of time. When light is understood in terms of solar radiation, it begins to challenge the absolute classification of light as a positive environmental outcome. Our work in Tokyo has suggested that cities are already utilizing shading at the urban scale to minimize energy consumption for maintaining optimal human comfort levels. This is particularly critical for Japan, which is not only hot and humid, but is also facing a major prolonged energy crisis. Therefore, site orientation form optimization for buildings may be able to maximize shade, minimize shadow, not for our present environment, but a future that is most certainly warmer within the useful life of the buildings themselves. Next, we look at the impact of new buildings on ambient light. And this can be quantified as the percent of sky visible from any given point. So the more sky visible, the more ambient light available. And London already regulates this through their rights to light measurement. And they measure the impact of new buildings on all residential, will on all residential windows. Um, and one of the ways they measure this is through the vertical sky component, which is the angle of sky visible. 
And so instead, we take that and apply that to the streets and public space of New York. And this was a particular concern in the design of one of our new skyscrapers, one Vanderbilt, which Justin mentioned previously. And in this case, um, managing the impact on ambient daylight for such a large building was of concern for us, but then also the process working with the Department of City Planning and the community board. So one of the things we did is we compared the impact of our building on the right on ambient daylight um, as compared with the impact of what currently exists there. And what we found is through the tapering and setbacks, it actually slightly improved the ambient light condition over what exists there, which is a straight extrusion. And given the difference in size of these buildings, I think it'll be important to unpack this a little bit because that result is a little bit unintuitive. So if next we take, these are four data points around the site where we're doing a, a 360, degree, 360 degree fisheye view um, to show what the image of that sky exposure looks like. And so here in the gray, we're mapping our building in comparison to what exists with the dashed orange line. And this is where you can see where the setbacks carving away and then especially the tapering start to hide the bulk of the tower. And next we apply this to the 57th Street corridor towers where we compare this um, ambient light impact of the bottom 20% in the saturated orange with the top 80% in the hatched orange. And what we found here is it's the, it's the base of the building that's having the greatest impact on ambient light access for these towers. Visibility, often relative to context, represents a quantification that can only be analyzed in qualitative terms. The challenge is for cities to weight perspectives and views that serve the dual interests of maintaining historic preservation, with the acknowledgement that cities are as dynamic in form as the people who inhabit them. This is an inherently subjective outcome on what perspectives should be privileged. As this slide demonstrates, with any given reality, two very different and equally valid perspectives may exist. In this case, a resident looking north may observe a fairly even distribution of buildings, while a resident looking west may observe a foreboding concentration of density. Other cities have regulations that protect the image of their skyline. For example, both London and San Francisco have protected strategic view and postcard views of certain landmarks from specified points. But instead of measuring visibility from a few privileged perspectives, we met, how about we measure visibility from all points in the city? Here's a comparison of the visibility of the Empire State Building, Time Warner Center, and the new towers on the 57th Street corridor from all points in Manhattan. The new towers are cl clearly more visible than the Time Warner Center to Empire State Building, creating a unique condition that while their impact on daylight and ambient light is local, due to their visibility, they engage the entire city. The tools and methods highlighted here today represent a few objective metrics that advance our own subjective interpretation and construction of our city. While these analytical advances now have the capacity to design and regulate buildings that are far superior in their performance to buildings only a generation removed, with a sensitivity to spatial and environmental quality of both buildings and their context, we hope this work advances a more well-informed public debate and acknowledges the application of science, as well as our own biases and preferences that can be distinguished between matters of economics, community engagement, and environmental performance. Thank you very much. Thank you.